People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. Terms and conditions apply. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to the Archaeology Show. TAS goes behind the headlines to bring you the real stories about archaeology and the history around us. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Show, episode 215. On today's show, we talk about the delicious archaeology of wine. Let's dig a little deeper into that wine fridge sitting right to my right. <laughs> Find some tasty treats. But not because it's 12 in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. But it's a Saturday. <laughs> Welcome to Drunken Archaeology, everybody. How's it going? Drunken Archaeology. <laughs> wow. Not quite. No. But there has been some days this week. Well, yeah. So we're in Arizona. Which you wouldn't think that there'd be a lot of wine tasting here, but it it's turns actually out more than one region. Yeah, there is, and we're in the southern area, kind of near Tucson, yeah. like about an hour outside of Tucson, southeast. And it's shocking how many wineries there are here. Probably like at least twenty, I yeah. think. And they are just making a really, really great wine product here. It's it's amazing. We've really enjoyed it. Yeah, I have to say we've been to a number of different wine regions and this is an, an official wine region in AVA, which means it's an American viticultural uh area. Uh, I don't know what the last day stands for. So no, no, I think it's area or something. Yeah. Anyway, either way, it's a it's a recognized certified, you know, wine making region. Making area. Yeah. yeah. And we've been to a number of those and it seems like when you go there there's like a predominant kind of wine because mm-hmm. like something is going to grow best there. Right. But here there seems to be a, a pretty decent mix between reds and whites. First off at yep. some of these wineries and the one we went to is like all reds. Um, that deep sky winery. Yeah, was all Yeah, that one was yeah. all reds, but. But there's been a lot of whites too. And, yeah. you know, if you start really looking at where they're getting their grapes, it's actually it's kind of interesting that a lot of the wineries here, while they do have vineyards, they're very small. They're very small. Yeah. And they don't have very many estate wines, which means grown there yeah it's like they're doing more wine making here yeah. than they are growing but that's fine because they're making some really great wines and we've really enjoyed a lot of the ones that we've tried we've filled up our wine fridge with different bottles from different yeah. vineyards around here but all that's to say it got us thinking what about the history of wine and winemaking and the archaeology of it like what is out there what can be found yeah, honestly, one of the things that really got me thinking about that, too, is there's a meadery out here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and mead is, I mean, everybody, when you think of mead, you think of, like, large tankards of mead with, yeah. like, turkey legs <laughs> right. from, like, you know, six, the 1600s or yeah. the 1300s or I something. I feel like it's got to be Vikings, but I don't know if Vikings actually yeah, drank mead or not, but yeah. that's what's in my head. <laughs> so, to, uh, yeah. shout out to listener Steven for telling us about the mead place, because it was amazing. We went there yesterday. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah, he did say that. It anyway, was really good. Yeah, so we thought we would we would cover like where does wine come from how old is it and, you know what were some of the work first wines made and and uh storage capabilities and stuff like that so yeah. that's what we're going to do on this episode yeah um, not really for this region although i originally thought about doing that but like it started in the 70s yeah it's not there's not a lot to to there's not a lot of history yet they're yeah. they're building history currently so yeah but the world itself has a huge wine history and wine making history so there's a lot yeah. of different stuff that can be found now, if you do some research out there, you might find that Iran, Iraq, that area, there's a lot of accounts where the first wine came from there. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons is because of a couple of things we'll talk about here in a in a little while. But there is some more recent evidence that the country of Georgia in the southern Caucasus is now being sort of heralded as the cradle of wine. Right. Now, is that because they like 
made wine, but also developed it and like created a, an industry around it. Is that why there's sort of becoming the cradle of wine? I think it's just because it's the earliest. Really? Okay. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, because a, a number of places where wine was accidentally discovered, wine yeah. was never purposely discovered. Right. But where it was accidentally discovered, I mean, an industry immediately popped up to yeah. say, let's perfect this and make more. Yeah, totally. The wine in Georgia, again, in the Southern Caucasus can be dated to about 6,000 BCE. Yeah. That's, yeah. So over 8,000 years yeah, ago. Yeah. That's a long time ago for sure. And yeah. Once it was, th- well, it wasn't really discussed how wine was discovered there. But we have evidence going back a long time that they actually buried grape juice uh, underground for the winter, probably as a storage method at mm-hmm. first, just to just to get it down there. But then realized occasionally that it would change dramatically by spring. Yeah. And then wine was born. Yep. The juice was stored in a, oh boy, I'm going to say that wrong. <laughs> Kevevri? Kev- <laughs> I think so. Kevevri. K-V-E-V-R-I. Or with a Q, either yeah. way. And it's an earthenware vessel used to also age the wine. And they have been used for thousands of years. Yeah. If you look at the article in the show notes from National Geographic, it's the top one in our show notes. Mm-hmm. You actually see this really cool room. And then there's holes where these cavevre were, were put down into and then they would cover them up. I mean, originally they were probably just buried in the in the mm-hmm. soil. But these are like official places where there's a network of holes and they literally just, you know, put them down in there yeah. and then that's where they were. Yeah, that's really cool. They found that wine could actually be stored for up to 50 years under there. So they were aging it as well mm-hmm. and, and, you know, really just storing it. Mm-hmm. it. You know, I'm not surprised that they learned that the longer it kind of sits, you know, and then maybe the, the, the how ripe the grapes were or yeah. whatever fruit they're using would definitely change the sugar content and then the alcohol content for, yeah. the, for the storage and of the, it. And the taste and the flavor too. So they probably you know, built a desire for yeah. older wines too, or aged wines. You know, we got GPSs. It makes me want to just like bury jars of grapes around the country that we travel <laughs> to different RV parks and then like come, come back, back to check. them a year later, <laughs> see if we've got well, some wine. <laughs> the one thing I have heard though, is that not all wine is meant to be aged and not all sure. wine ages well. So I think it definitely takes a certain amount of knowledge about the grapes you're using and what you're putting into yeah. it to know what is going to age well. And it sounds like these guys were really figuring that out back then. A lot of pure fruit wine doesn't actually age. Yeah. Well, it'll age, but poorly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, (laughs) so the country of Georgia, they import wine around the world with the biggest recipient being the United States. There was a Russian alcohol embargo, so to speak, when the USSR was really in charge of all those countries around there. Uh huh. And a lot of Georgian winemaking facilities suffered from that. Yeah. Uh, either went out of business or whatever. But, mm-hmm. you know, at the fall of the Soviet Union and the independence of those countries around there, including Georgia, they're coming back. Started it up strong. Again. Yeah. yeah. And even now they're using, some of them are using the traditional methods for, methods for storage That's and fermentation. That's so cool. And yeah. you said the U.S. is one of the biggest importers, yeah. right? I, yeah. I feel like we need if you to want to find it. Yeah, I know. Like next time we go to a big wine store or total wine or something, see if we yeah. can find one from Georgia. That would be really cool to try it. I know. You always see like the big names on there, like Spain and France yeah. and Italy and Argentina. California. Yeah. You California. Know? Yeah. Even Australia. Yeah. I've never seen Georgia. No, I definitely haven't. But well, there's always an other section, right? Yeah. So it's got to be there. I'll yeah. have to check it out. There are other stories of wine being discovered, of course. Nobody thinks that wine was discovered in one place and then sent around the right. world. Pretty much everybody discovered wine. I'll get yeah. to that at the end of the segment. Mm-hmm. But there's a really fun Persian fable that I don't think anybody thinks is actually true. <laughs> but it's, it's fun. Fables aren't usually true, yeah. but they might be slightly based on reality. There might be some yeah. thread of truth running through it. Right, right. <laughs> so there was a princess in the city of Persepolis who lost favor with the king. Mm-hmm. The shame was so overwhelming that she tried to take her life. By drinking the juice of some grapes that had spoiled in a jar. So she sees a bunch of rotten grapes and she's like, well, this will surely kill me because they're rotten. Because <laughs> they're gross. Yeah, because that's gross. But instead of dying, she became giddy, then intoxicated and then passed out. So I don't know how much of that she drank, <laughs> but she really went into it. Yeah. And when she woke, she felt like all her troubles were gone. And she took this discovery to the king who loved it so much that he accepted her back. Mm-hmm. So true or not. Like I said, wine was discovered accidentally yeah. in lots of different places. Yeah, for sure. There's actually, there's another article that we linked to, a Sapiens article. And there's this thing called the drunken monkey hypothesis. And it was conceived by Robert Dudley in the early 2000s. And it's basically saying that hominids have had a predilection for 
fermented fruits. Yeah. Like basically since the dawn of, of man. Right. And it's partly because fermented fruit was easier to smell and find and then therefore eat. Yeah. And there's some healthy things like probiotics and antimicrobial components to it so that are good. And then, you know, you get a little bit of a buzz off of it. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it's definitely been something that primates and humans have been attracted yeah. to for a very long time. Yeah. And one place that wine probably before the discovery of the the Georgian wines over there Mm -hmm. um, was also thought of as one of the earliest was in Iran at the site of Haji Firuz. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. uh, (laughs) Tepe and Tepe just means hill really Uh in the northern Zagros mountains again of Iran. The site dates to the Neolithic and the Neolithic is about 8500 to 4000 BCE. But carbon dating of the wine remnants that they found Mm -hmm. was about 5400 to 5000 BCE. Okay. So Getting back towards what, how old the Georgian wine was. Mm-hmm. And that's not saying this, this there's not older stuff here. It's just we haven't found it and been able to date it. Right, right. Yeah. It was around 6,000 BCE that agriculture really exploded into many different societies. And wine was discovered shortly after that when, that you know, because yeah. people get together <laughs> and what do they want to do? They want to drink. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, as soon as people started, you know, really harvesting and growing their own fruit and yeah. vegetables and things like that. They had too much of it. Yeah. Before it was hunter gathering, you you basically collected what you had. Yeah. Now Native Americans and and other societies around the world have stored nuts and things for the winter because mm-hmm. in the winter there's there's not a lot of resources. Mm-hmm. So you kind of kind of prepare, store that stuff, and then so you can have it to eat. Yeah. And there's no different with fruit. They probably realized early on that fruit probably wouldn't keep. So I'm, I'm willing to bet a lot yeah. of places didn't try it, but the ones that did found that yeah, some of it kept because it was frozen, but other places that. You know, hey, it rotted a little bit, turned into something but better. But turned into something else. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you have to guess that there's an accidental discovery in so yeah. many different places, really. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm. Finally, one more story from Egypt. There's some hieroglyphics that show that pre-dynastic Egypt, and that's a long time ago, again, mm-hmm. this four to 6,000 year time range, mm-hmm. shows that those pharaohs would often just binge drink <laughs> and not really care about the quality of the wine, but more the quantity of the wine. How could they know that from hieroglyphics, though? You know, hieroglyphics are very descriptive because yeah. it's not just the hieroglyphics, but also pictures to go along with that. Yeah. And the article didn't really get into that, but I'm willing to bet like there's images of like a pharaoh just like laying up against the throne or something like that with like bottles around him or something. Yeah. I don't know. And I guess they know it was a cheap wine because like the hieroglyph itself was like the equivalent of two buck chuck or something, right? Like well, <laughs> it was either that or it was what their wine is made from because it wasn't oh, like right. what we would call the highest quality wine right, typically. Right, it was more right. fruit wines. Yeah. They totally. did have wine made from white, pink, green, red, and dark blue grapes. Oh, wow. And then also figs, palm, dates, and pomegranates. So they had a whole method around doing it and mm-hmm. all their stuff. But I think just in the context of wine today, we wouldn't consider what they had as like top quality wine. Right. They were doing it for the effect, not the taste. Well, they may not have even known it wasn't top quality wine, to be honest. No, you have what you have, right? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we're going to go from there and head up into the Mediterranean, of course, because that's where all wine in the Mediterranean has been stored underwater. (laughs) So, you know, there's probably millions of gallons of wine and down at the bottom of the Mediterranean, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Is if the... Jars haven't broken, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> we're we're going to talk about that on the other side of the break. Back in a minute. <laughs> chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since... Now, order yours today in the Zax Rewards app. Woo, saucy! Zaxby's. Welcome back to episode 215 of the Archaeology Show, the wine edition, <laughs> where yep. we we whine on about... Uh, oh, that's a good yeah, one. You whining, are always whining. Whining about history. <laughs> yeah. We've got to get this recording done so we can do some wine tasting. Yeah, totally. It's our last day here, so yeah, more absolutely. wine tasting to be done. Yep. In the last segment, we were talking about jugs and residue that had been found in the jugs. So we know for sure it's wine, right? And in this segment, we have a couple articles that are about shipwrecks where wine containers have been found. So it's not exactly the residue, but it is a really interesting way to look at the history of wine and the production of it, where it was going, who was drinking it and that kind of a thing. So 
That's what we're talking about here. So in 2021, archaeologists off the coast of Palermo, Sicily, discovered an ancient Roman shipwreck that was full of the wine jugs that are called amphorae. Amphorae. Yeah. Yeah. Those were used for transporting wine and olive oil across the Mediterranean. Yeah. So the thing about this is that we don't know if it was wine or olive oil that was in it, obviously, because they're underwater and they could do some chemical analysis maybe Mm -hmm. but i think the water and being in salt water just mostly washes everything away so you just don't really have much of a way to know what was actually in it yeah for sure and four are really really cool jugs and you've probably seen them before they have a kind of a rounded or a pointed bottom sometimes it's a flat bottom but the inside will go to a point Mm -hmm. so there's a, a lot of different styles and types but the one thing they always have are large handles on either side so that you could lift it with two hands because they'd be really big usually. And then those handles are on either side of a somewhat narrow neck. I wonder if they were pointed either internally or externally as a point to like focus sediments and things like that. I, uh, yeah, I was yeah. wondering that maybe or if if it was pointed on the outside you see these with like mineral bottles too, mm-hmm. like from, you know, a hundred years ago and they were rounded on the bottom so that they had to be laid on their side. And I think it had to do with the minerals and stuff so that they wouldn't, I don't know, it had to do something with collecting those minerals right. and the sediments or whatever. Yeah. All right. Well, the shipwreck that you found in this article dates from about the second century BCE. Mm-hmm. So a long time ago, they were transporting wine or olive oil, whatever, across yeah. the Mediterranean. We know they had wine, so that's, you know, probably yeah. was included. Yeah, we definitely move forward in time from the last segment. Mm-hmm. This isn't necessarily origins, but it's about what people were yeah. doing in this time frame with wine and taking it where they were taking it and that kind of thing. Yeah, it was definitely a well-known, well-matured industry at this point. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and this shipwreck, it's on the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, and it's at a depth of 302 feet. So it's quite deep there. And so far... Since this article was written, I think about a year ago or almost two years ago, they only have taken photos of the amphora, but it's like literal piles of them <laughs> on the the bottom of the of the sea. So if you you know go check out that article link, you can see the pictures of them. They're really cool. They're just yeah. like piled on top of each other. And I suppose it's possible because they do look closed. A lot of them do. So I suppose it's possible that if they can get some of them up, they'll find some residue. Maybe. I mean, mm-hmm. unless they were sealed with like some sort of a wax or something like that. I feel like water would have just seeped in. You by would now. think so. I mean, they yeah. are ceramic, but like ceramic isn't impervious to, you know, being soaked underwater. Well, <laughs> I mean, this ceramic would have been fired to a point where it would have had it yeah. would have had to have had a water impervious glaze because otherwise the it wine would, would just, eventually leak yeah, out. Yeah, it would leak out. True. Even with years of aging, which yeah. they were doing at that point. So, I mean, I guess it's, it's possible. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, that was just the the one discovery of a shipwreck and they were all Roman too. That that was Roman wine and it was a Roman shipwreck and they don't mm-hmm. really know a whole lot about it except for the pictures that they've taken. But that article actually linked back to another one, which was an even cooler situation, shipwreck situation. Shipwrecks are just like a (laughs) goldmine for this kind of discovery because the ceramic pots usually preserve pretty well. And depending on the depth, you can often, you know, get them off the ocean or seafloor. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, back in 2015, there was an expedition that found like a shipwreck jackpot. (laughs) There were 22 shipwrecks in one spot. Did you read why that happened? Was it all at the same time or just a place where ships crashed? It So they date, they range in date from like 700 to okay. 480 BCE. So it's a pretty, that's like kind of a tight yeah. time range. But, but I'm willing to bet there were either, you know, a couple hundred years of pirates that were just taking down ships right there. Or it was a shortcut, and but more hazardous. It might have been. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the area they were found around is the Forni Archipelago in Greece. And it's a small set of islands that they they didn't stop on these islands. The traders didn't. But the way it's set up and the rockiness of it and there'd be these like south storms that would come in from the south and it would just, you know, bad or, bad luck, bad timing. And the ship goes down. Well, the people that live there were like, not going to stop here. huh? Well, <laughs> we got a surprise for you. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how they would do that. I guess they could be pirates that boarded but but why would they let all that delicious wine sink to the bottom of the sea if they were pirates well because it was probably some of the best wine in the world which we'll talk about in segment three because these (laughs) ships were on their way past this archipelago uh, on the way from greece to cyprus and then egypt yeah so yeah cyprus is going to feature heavily in segment three yes definitely and we know there's a lot of wine production going on in that area so 
Anyway, the archipelago is rocky, like I said. So most of like the ships themselves, the wooden bits and all of that have been destroyed, rotted away and are gone. What they have are like these piles of cargo Mm -hmm. (laughs) that are like mostly together on the bottom of the sea. So that's how they identified the fact that there were 22 different shipwrecks. And in some of those shipwrecks, they have just like tons of wine and foray. Right. And the other interesting thing here, all of the different types of amphorae were where they were able to figure out where they came from, what region, what place and and that kind of thing. So they're kind of like able to build these like trade routes mm-hmm. of the ships that were going past this archipelago, knowing where they were going, where they were coming from and that kind of thing. And the amphorae were really key in helping them identify those sorts yeah. of information and draw these trade routes, which is really cool. Yeah. What's really interesting about say the archeology span archeologists in the future, looking at time periods like the one that we're in now mm-hmm. back long enough ago, even, I don't know, 50 to a hundred years ago. And then through all of time beyond that, you could often tell where something came from because of the sometimes minute, sometimes obvious stylistic differences mm-hmm. in the same types of things, because mm-hmm. there just wasn't, Either A, a lot of communication culturally between disparate groups. Right. Or B, there was individualized style, Mm -hmm. you know, and and you couldn't just have, despite what these shipwrecks will tell you, you you wouldn't necessarily have like one big Amazon of wine and and olive oil production sending it across all of the Mediterranean. Totally. There were different industries all over the place and then they wanted to trade and sell it wherever they could. Mm -hmm. They were going all over the place and that's really cool. But nowadays... I mean, there really is like companies get gobble up other companies of the same style and type. And then there's just like one thing. They make it very uniform. Yeah. yeah. And it's sold around the world. Yeah. And and if you think about it, too, like back in before the Internet, basically, yeah. you know, you couldn't just hop online and find out all the information about a winer, winery or a winemaking region or whatever. Yeah. But what they probably had were distinctive bottle shapes or amphora, yeah. amphora shapes. So. You know, you might be in Greece and a ship from Cyprus comes along and you see him unloading this distinctive style of amphorae of a winemaker that you really like. And you're like, oh, yeah. got to get there first. Got to go by that. <laughs> you know, so I, I would imagine those differences and distinct shapes were really important to their marketing, <laughs> essentially. Oh, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. All right. Well. We've talked about some of the history of wine and and some of the big winemaking regions like around the Mediterranean, of course. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to talk about the oldest wine still in production, which I thought was super cool. Mm -hmm. And we'll do that on the other side of the break. People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match with Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. Terms and conditions apply. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo saucy. Zaxby's. All right. Welcome back to episode 215 of the Archaeology Show. And we're talking about wine. And this last article that we found is about the oldest wine still in production or thought to be, you know, the oldest wine still in production. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say it's been made by the same like company this whole time, but okay. the type of wine has been made. Okay, you okay. know, since it was, well, since it was discovered, really, and it, it could have been made before that. Okay. So we're talking about Cyprus in the Mediterranean again. Mm-hmm. It's a sweet dessert wine called Kemendaria. Oh, and actually, okay. you look at some of the pictures in the article that I've got linked, and this one is called Saint John. Camandaria. Mm. I don't know if the uh, name of that has changed through time, but Saint John. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Anyway, this is made from grapes called Zinesteri and Red Marvo grapes. 
and they're grown in the Trudos Mountains on the island of Cyprus. Okay. I think they're grown on the southern shores, actually, mm. uh, is what I read. Yeah. And they've been making this since 800 BCE. Wow. On that island. Wow. 800 BCE, the same yeah. type of wine. That's really cool. Yeah. Because, you know, varietals come and go in popularity. So I think it's probably yeah. pretty uncommon to see the same one yeah. for over, what, 20, many thousands of years. 2,000? 3,000, probably. 3,000, yeah. yeah give or you take. know, somewhere like that. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Whatever. I drank wine last night. Okay. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> Actually, I don't think you drank any wine last night. I'm cutting the next all of show this is, out. The next show is about whiskey. <laughs> I'm for sure editing all of this out. <laughs> this episode is edited by me. <laughs> so the grapes are picked when they are ripe to almost overripe, which, as you might imagine, gives more sugar to the wine, making it sweeter. And that's why this is a dessert wine. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, we call this a dessert wine today, but they did just like drink it back in the day. Yeah, yeah. The grapes were pressed for up to three months after some drying in the sun. Mm-hmm. They go in oak barrels for at least two years for aging and fermentation. Mm -hmm. And the character of the wine, uh, according to this article anyway, has aromas of like caramel and cocoa and has notes of raisins, which you would love, and then figs (laughs) and honey. So So is it kind of like a port? Kind of, I would imagine. I say that port tastes like raisins, which I think makes people that like port really mad, but (laughs) it's just not to my taste personally. (laughs) This is a wine. A port has a very defined yeah. Meaning, right. But but it probably it sounds a lot like it tastes like a pork. Yeah. And yeah. like a dessert wine usually is like got that thicker consistency like pork yeah. does, too. So a they're probably bit. closer to each other. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So the name of this Commandaria goes all the way back to the 12th century when King Richard the Lionheart captured Cyprus. OK. okay? Now, so this was in the 1100s. Um, mm-hmm. He loved Cyprus so much. He even had his wedding there. I don't know how many times he got married, but he has one of his weddings there. <laughs> and he, at, at the festivities and every time he was there, they served uh, this wine and he called it, King Richard actually called it the wine of kings and the king of wines. Wow. I don't know why that's not on the bottle right now, but <laughs> he actually sold the islands to the Knights Templar in 1191 uh-huh. uh, and they began producing massive quantities of the wine to help fund their efforts and they named it Camandaria after the region that was under their control. Oh, okay. Yeah. So wouldn't it be Commandaria? Maybe like Commandaria because it's spelled like Command A R I A. Yeah, so I don't know. We're probably pronouncing com- it completely yeah, wrong. Yeah, probably. I mean, that's it's par for the course with us. Well, I mean, it's basically <laughs> Greek too. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, but, true, true. Yeah, and here's the fun thing too. What's thought of as the first winemaking tasting competition that we actually have records for mm-hmm. took place in the 13th century and was hosted by King Philip Augustus. I mean, he was a French king mm-hmm. and. The wine won the competition, and he called it the Apostle of Wines. Wow. Yeah, so lots okay. of accolades. Yeah. You know, I think it was probably just so different than yeah. wine people were drinking that yep. it was, I mean, when you think of a dessert wine, if even if you don't like sweet things, you probably occasionally like a Hershey's Kiss or, mm-hmm. you know, a piece of chocolate or something like that. This probably had a real chocolatey feel to it, and it, yeah. it like a real desserty feel. And if you're like, my God, I can just drink this as wine, this is wine. I, it's going to win everything. It was probably so distinct. Yeah, you know? probably. I can't imagine there was a lot of dessert wines at the time. Yeah. And well, like sweet stuff in general, just like it wasn't yeah. it wasn't like it is today with sugar and everything, you know. Yeah. So this was one way that you would get that taste of something sweet in that time frame. So and, and fruit, like fruit and yeah. things you do with fruit were the only ways to get that kind of sweet taste. Yeah, sugar. So. Sugar was really hard to come by. Yeah. And, and the ability to just produce something like this. Yeah. And and have it be so sweet. Yeah, it would have been yeah. uh, would have been something people thought after. Well, it sounds delicious. And it sounds like we should yeah. put this on our list to look for the next time we're at Total yeah. Wine or something too. I don't know if they import it or what, but we're gonna have to head to the other regions section of the wine area. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Check them out. So all right. Well, this is a shorter episode this week, primarily because we are we are at this RVing event yeah. and there just hasn't been time to do anything. But it's pretty cool. We love talking about this kind of stuff. So Yeah, I love a deep dive on a subject. And you know, wine is hard because you you don't often get the the residue that allows you to date it, right? Like Mm -hmm. sometimes you do, like the ones we talked about in the first segment, but oftentimes you're dating the things around it. Yeah. You know, the jugs or the facility that they're making it or whatever. So it it is sort of one of those things that is kind of hard to find in the archaeological records sometimes. Well, and here's the thing. If you do find something, 
was it wine or just like rotten fruit? Oh, right. Totally. <laughs> like, did they do it on purpose? Especially when you're talking about the really older dates. It's like, okay, yeah. were they trying to make wine here or did they just leave some oh. grapes in this jug for too long? I, I, I didn't even p- bother putting this in the show, but I'm going to talk about it now. Yeah. I found one unsupported line <laughs> that said that there was fossil evidence from 60 million years ago of a what could have been a wine-like substance. So what, no I'm, way. what I'm guessing is, I don't know how you get this as fossil evidence. That doesn't make yeah. any sense to me. But it was more than likely something that was, again, crushed or mm-hmm. just otherwise left alone fruit. Yeah. And it fermented. And then that whole area right there is fossilized yeah. in some way, shape or form. And mm. I don't know how you would even come to the conclusion that it was wine. But the point is, there's been fruit on this planet for hundreds of millions of years. Right. And that means... I mean, that means there's been wine on this planet for yeah, hundreds of millions of years. For sure. Because fruit falls off of trees and the animals that don't eat it, you know, if that just sits there or maybe another tree falls on it mm-hmm. and or it falls in the right conditions. I mean, it's going to rot and ultimately ferment. Yeah, definitely. You know? I mean, there's so many stories and ways that we sort of guess that people discovered wine. Yeah. There's one called the Paleolithic Hypothesis, which is, again, in that Sapiens article. It's a really cool article to just give you like a quick overview of the history of wine. But the way he describes it, it's just, it's so simple. You almost can't even take credit for this hypothesis. (laughs) The the guy, Patrick McGovern, that created it. But it's basically roaming bands of humans, gathering food. They came upon wild grapes and put them into a woven basket because this is pre-ceramics. Yeah. And the the fruit, the weight of the fruit crushed the bottom layer and probably you know, liquid came out of it. And we do that in our grocery bags today. I know. Right. And (laughs) by the time they ate the fruit off the top and got to the bottom stuff and realized that it was crushed, it had begun to ferment and voila, they have wine and they probably were like, Oh wow, this is actually really good and started doing it on purpose. But like to, to take credit for that as a hypothesis seems a little silly to me because everybody's like anybody who sits and thinks for a minute is like, yeah, that's probably how that happened. Yeah. But <laughs> anyway, I, I honestly think it was it had to do with storage because yeah. they are, are really pre, you know, historic ancestors before agriculture, before mm-hmm. all of that stuff. They had to store stuff over the winter and yeah. no doubt they tried to store fruit. Yeah. You know, and, and whether or not they they were successful at it, you know, before the fruit really froze, they would have had to put it underground or wherever they're going to store it mm-hmm. before everything froze. And in those conditions, yeah, there probably was a weight issue where mm-hmm. things were getting crushed and just wasn't done the best way. So there's going to be juice down there. Yep. And if it's the right conditions, I mean, that stuff will will ferment. It will, you know? yeah. And they probably, not knowing what that smell was and, and probably seeing rotten fruit around it, mm-hmm. just chucked it for a long time. I know. I'm wondering like how many people were like, oh, whoops, made a mistake, throw it yeah. out and didn't even bother trying it. And well, maybe it takes somebody who's really, really hungry to be like, I don't care. Yeah. I need to eat something. I'm going to eat these rotten grapes. Oh, wait, <laughs> this is delicious. <laughs> I just made a million dollars. <laughs> right. There you go. Totally. Anyway. All right. Well, that's this episode for this week. We're going to go do some wine tasting and test our hypotheses. Uh huh. Yeah. And we'll see if we can find these wines we talked about. And uh, <laughs> probably we'll, not here we'll, in Arizona. <laughs> maybe not. But if we ever find them, we'll definitely let you guys know how good or not they are. <laughs> I know we're heading into California for the next couple of months, and the only wine California sells is Californian wine. Right. <laughs> it's hard to find other wine. Well, because California wine is so good, as the I mean, 1976 competition showed, where it was a blind taste test between European Paris. wines. Yeah, the yeah in Paris, a blind taste test between California wines and European wines, and California won. So, yep. <laughs> indeed, we know California wine is good. We're excited. All right, we'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Archaeology Show. Feel free to comment and view the show notes on the website at www.archpodnet.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ArcPodNet. Music for this show is called I Wish You Would Look from the band Sea Hero. Again, thanks for listening and have an awesome day. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. People are driven by the search for better. 
But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match with Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. Terms and conditions apply. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo saucy. Zaxby's. Come. 